One of my favorite philosophers is Ludwig Wittgenstein, the Austrian-English philosopher. He's my favorite because his life was just so interesting. He just showed up at Cambridge University and said, I want to take classes here. And Bertrand Russell, for some bizarre reason, said yes. Wittgenstein studied under Russell for a few years, then went back home to Austria to fight in World War I for the Austria-Hungarian army, became a POW in the war, and while a prisoner, wrote his most famous book, the Tractatus Logical Philosophicus, came back to, to Cambridge, taught at Cambridge for a few years, then just quit, went back to Austria to teach grade school kids, quit that, showed back up at Cambridge, and had an entirely different philosophy that completely rejected everything that he said in the Tractatus. Now, obviously, Ludwig Wittgenstein's life is worthy of an episode, but I would refer you instead to a much better telling of Wittgenstein's life, the fabulous book by Ray Monk, Ludwig Wittgenstein, The Duty of Genius. It's one of the best biographies in history. I'll put a link to it on my website. It's just a great book. Look it up. But what I'll talk about here is some of Wittgenstein's philosophy. It's, again, so big and so huge, it's difficult to fit it all in. But, but as I've already mentioned, Wittgenstein had two entirely different philosophical systems. Some say that there are three different systems for, for Wittgenstein. But I'll just try to make it simpler here and say, well, first he had his Tractatus period. And in the Tractatus, what... Wittgenstein tried to do is fulfill the dream of a logically perfect language. The Tractatus is one of the strangest books ever written. It's just a series of numbered statements about the world and how language describes our world. But I'm going to downplay the Tractatus in this podcast, one, because it has been done to death by analytical philosophers, and Wittgenstein was one of the biggest inspirations for logical positivism and analytical philosophy. But if Ludwig Wittgenstein said that there's nothing in the Tractatus that he wants to hold on to, why should we? It's an interesting exercise in and of itself. It's a curiosity of philosophical history. But if Wittgenstein refutes it, I'm going to go with that. But the idea in the Tractatus was that a logically perfect language was possible if we just get our terms right. And in the Tractatus, Ludwig Wittgenstein did give logicians some very valuable tools. But in that time, after Wittgenstein quit Cambridge University to go back to Austria, he slowly came to realize that the Tractatus was wrong. He refuted his own book abandoned philosophy entirely and all of academia because he realized that all of his work and all of Bertrand Russell's work was incorrect. And since he spoke of the Tractatus no more, neither will I. So I'll pick up the story in 1929, 10 years after the Tractatus was published, when Wittgenstein returned to become a lecturer in philosophy at the University of Cambridge. Again, he just showed up and said, hi, can I have a job? And they made a job for him, just like they made him a PhD student because he asked. I wish things were that simple today. In the 12 years that Wittgenstein was at Cambridge University, where he taught students, he never published anything, but his lectures began to show a bold new style of philosophy. His students later said that his lectures were very unconventional. He did not have a set topic. He instead talked about whatever was on his mind that day. He would ramble on, then have very long pauses as he thought deeply about some philosophical problem. And what was usually on his mind were the philosophical problems of language. Wittgenstein had come to realize in his time away that he had not solved the philosophical problems of language in the Tractatus as he had once thought. In two academic years, several of his students took copious lecture notes and made copies of them with a mimeograph machine to share with their fellow students. They bound them in cloth and shared them with other students and faculty, and those lecture notes have come to be known by the color of the cloth covers of the books. The notes from the 1933-34 academic year were the blue books, and the 34-35 academic year's lectures were known as the brown book. But in these books, 
were the roots of a new philosophy. Wittgenstein had abandoned analytical philosophy, had abandoned Bertrand Russell's idea of logical atomism, this idea that we can understand the world as a collection of discrete facts, atoms, atomistic, and we can describe this atomistic reality with a perfect atomistic language of discrete nouns and verbs and connecting words. But Wittgenstein realized that that's not what language is. And he realized that we don't learn language through application of strict rules. We don't use language according to strict rules. Well, yeah, most of us are taught the rules of grammar, but how we use language are ways that we learn through a plethora of life experiences. We learn how to use language through our use of language. We learn by doing and applying ways of doing things with language to our activities. Wittgenstein's insightful analogy is to call what we do with language a language game. Sprachspiel in German. Language game. Now in any game, from checkers to cricket to football to baseball, we learn the basic rules. But it is only through practice that we really learn how to play any game or any sport. We learn by doing, and language is the same. Yes, there are rules, but the rules are not all-encompassing. And we can know the rules, but still not know how to speak the language. I could learn all the rules of grammar for any foreign language and still not be able to comprehend the language, certainly not be able to use it as a native speaker of that language uses it. What we need is to learn the language game, because it is by playing the language game that we truly learn how to use the language. That's because words do not have this logical one-to-one -one correspondence with objects that Wittgenstein had learned from Russell and had written about in the Tractatus. Quite the contrary, words are inexact. An example that Wittgenstein gives of how this works is learning the word pencil. One could try to teach the word by pointing at a pencil and saying, pencil. But the listener could associate that word with a number of things. The pencil as a whole, the wood it is made of, the shape of it, the color, and so on. Only through context and use of the object do we come to understand the words for it. Then, when we use language, we are playing a language game. Now, Wittgenstein did write a book. He didn't publish it, but he wrote enough notes and structure of the book that it was later published after his death as The Philosophical Investigation. And it was Wittgenstein developing his ideas throughout the 1930s. Now, he largely stopped during World War II because instead of teaching, he volunteered for the British war effort for several years. By 1946, he had written most of this new book, part one of what would be a two-part book. And he'd had it accepted for publication, but Wittgenstein, being the permanent perfectionist that he was, withdrew it, worried that it wasn't finished, and he kept working on it, working on it. And only after his death did his former students gather to publish the first part, along with some of his other notes that would have been components of the second part. This book, Philosophical Investigations, expands on the themes of Wittgenstein's lectures that he gave in the 1930s that his students published as the Brown Book and Blue Books. Philosophical Investigations is slightly less bizarre than the Tractatus, but similarly, it is a collection of thoughts rather than a systematic narrative. What becomes obvious from the contents of philosophical investigations is that Wittgenstein is doing philosophy as an activity of open imagination and thinking. Often he is telling stories of real-life situations that demonstrate how language works. Wittgenstein's stories in philosophical investigation demonstrate his new theory of language and what it means, what language means for philosophy. He begins by, at length, indirectly criticizing his own theory of language in the Tractatus. Words, he now said, do not get their meaning from logical one-to-one -one correspondence with objects. 
but from their use within a social context. That important shift in definition leads to a further shift from the Tractatus. Instead of seeing philosophical problems as problems of logic, Wittgenstein now sees them as the lack of a clear view of the use of our words. To get a clear view of the meaning of words, we need to examine their use in the language. Three of Wittgenstein's important concepts are revealed when we start to examine words in this way. That word meanings rely on family resemblances. That words make sense only in the context of language games. And that language games make sense only in the context of forms of life. Particular sets of interlaced practices and understandings of our culture. To discuss the first two concepts, he uses the example of the word game, the word itself, game. What is a game? How would we define it? We can't, as Wittgenstein says, just point to various games and define the word by examples. Now, it's worth pointing out here that, remember, Wittgenstein's word for language games, which is the German word Sprachspiel, contains the German word for game, Spiel. Spiel, the German word, has a broader sense than the English word game. Spiel extends in its use to the act of play and playing itself. So this German sense of the word is more suggestion of an ongoing action or activity, which helps us better understand Wittgenstein's use of Spachspiel in his discussion of language games. Wittgenstein discusses several possible meanings for the word game. Competition, enjoyment, having a set of rules, and so on, but shows how each is inadequate to describe what games are. What we see when we think about the meaning of the word game is that all of the many objects and activities that we call games share a family resemblance. Well, when you look at a biological family, they don't all look exactly the same. They share enough common features of appearance that you recognize them as members of the same family. They may all have the same nose, but they don't need to all share one particular feature to resemble each other. They often have similar enough features that we see the family resemblance. And the same, Wittgenstein says, is true for the word game. Solitaire, checkers, water polo, slot machines, and mind games all share enough similar features that we can see the family resemblance that they are indeed all games. What he takes from this exercise is that an exact definition is neither possible nor required for the word to have meaning. If someone says, let's play a game, we understand what is meant despite the lack of specificity. Words get their meanings from their use. And Wittgenstein talks about their use in terms of language games. Similar to the American pragmatist philosophers, Wittgenstein said that we use words as tools to do things in the world. Language is part of our activities in the world, and our uses of language are as varied as our activities are. Wittgenstein describes the many activities in which we use words as various language games. He mentions giving orders, describing an object's appearance, speculating about what may happen, making a joke, translating from one language to another, requesting something, thanking someone, cursing, praying, on and on and on. Each activity is itself a language game. Within each type of activity, the various ways of expressing ideas and actions have internal family resemblances that show they are related and can be called language games, despite how much they vary. Our many ways of speaking do not all conform to a single model, but their commonalities include that they are all activities, all have purposes and goals, and they are all used by people who have a shared understanding about the rules of the language game. This last resemblance is crucial. Words and sentences do not have meanings in themselves. They have the meanings that we people give them. And these meanings are how we use the words. If I say table, I have not communicated anything to you unless we are both playing the same language game. If you were asking me where to set something, you'd know what I mean. If I say, put it on the table, 
If I'm teaching you English, you know how to point to the table. If I'm quizzing you on German, you would respond instead with Tisch. As Wittgenstein says, we don't simply speak, we do things by speaking. Language games, then, are human activities in which words help us accomplish our goals. Words are tools. And just like we would use a hammer to pound nails, but not to cut a board in two, we'd use a saw for that, we use different words for different purposes in different situations. Plus, we often will use the same word in multiple different situations or different language games. Like the word table, if I'm in a legislative body, if I say, we're going to table that bill, that's a very different meaning than setting it on the dining room table. Another great example is the word lose. We can lose our keys, lose sleep, lose a game, lose our train of thought, lose confidence in somebody. If we are playing the language game of talking about going for a drive, if you say you lost your keys, I can help you find them. But can I help you find it is without sense if we are talking about how you are very worried about something and losing sleep over it. Wittgenstein illustrates his concept by imagining a language game of two people building a stone wall. Because language helps us accomplish our goals, the workers could accomplish their task of building a wall with a language of very few words. Builder A could communicate to his helper B by calling out brick, cube, and slab to request a stone of a certain size to build the wall. Builder B would understand and respond to the request. Within the context of the language game, brick is all A needs to say to B, to ask B to bring a brick. But outside that particular language game, if A says brick, no one would know for sure what A means. Again, and always, all words have meaning within a particular context of actions. The point of all this, according to Wittgenstein, is that the demand of the logical positivists that we have one set of logical language rules to which all language must conform is wrong. There are as many set of rules as there are language games, though again the sets of rules have family resemblances. Wittgenstein now realized that the mistake he made in the Tractatus was to try to force language to conform to the crystalline purity of logic. But language isn't calculus. Language is living. Wittgenstein now saw that philosophical problems arise when, he said, language goes on holiday. Uh, that's a Britishism there. There's a language game. Holiday in the British language game is like the American word vacation. So in this language game, when the proper use of language has gone away and is no longer on the job, philosophical problems arise. It's gone on vacation. It's gone on holiday. It's gone off the deep end. It's absent. What the logical positivists were doing were mixing language games by trying to force the rules of logic onto other language games. Speculative philosophies, such as Leibniz, etc., can make the same mistake by trying to impose the language game of talking about worldly things onto higher and deeper realities and ideas. This is one area where Wittgenstein still agreed with his Tractatus, that there is indeed the inexpressible, something mystical that is beyond words in reality. The role of philosophy, then, is not to try to impose structure on language or life, but to learn from them, to learn from life, to learn from language. Wittgenstein states that when philosophers use a word like knowledge, and try to grasp the essence of it, they need to ask how the word is used in the language game that is its original home. The philosopher needs to bring the word back to its everyday use. Wittgenstein uses everyday similar to the way Heidegger does, how we act in normal life without introspection. We're just going about our everyday lives. Wittgenstein seems to suggest that philosophy needs to stop trying to find perfect forms and perfect knowledge and step aside to let everyday normal life show us what is the case. He says at various points in the philosophical investigation what he sees as the proper role of philosophy. 
Philosophy simply puts things before us, make them open to view, and they need not explain things. Philosophy should not question or interfere with how language is used, but can only describe it. As said previously, people use language within language games, and language games are played within an activity. Wittgenstein further describes our activities as occurring within a, what he calls a form of life. Our actions, and thus our language, are interlaced with our practices, our interests, our goals, and our understandings, which are all shaped by our culture and our place within it. On a social level, the interlaced practices and understandings of a culture are its form of life. The point is that it is the cultural forms of life that provide people with the meanings of words, and it is this social backdrop of meanings that renders language intelligible. Human culture is organic. It grew and continues to evolve on its own. It did not and does not ask philosophers to justify what it does. For that reason, forms of life themselves are the justification for definitions of words and the rules of language. Again, language develops from use, it's understood by its use as tools in our everyday lives, and it is the forms of life the human culture itself that defines language, defines its use, defines what we do with language. And no further justification is needed. And there is no further logic to it. Language simply works. Even logic itself, it simply works. We can't justify logic. We can't prove logic. It just works. And all the non-logical things that also work. Nietzsche had a similar idea, actually, of... Even lies can be useful if they work. Back to language and more truthful things. Language enables us to communicate and do things. Language is a tool. It lives and grows with us. We are not language. Structuralists were wrong. We are not language. Language is us.